Margaret, I guess I want to begin by asking what draws you in both as a writer and as a reader into one work or another? I think voice is a crucial aspect of what draws me in. Of course, I read for characters and situation and exciting plots, but it's when I read a sentence that I think only this writer could have written this sentence. Um, there's some unusual word, some particularly precise way of describing a red car. Um, that, that is often really what makes me keep reading and want to enter into this writer's sensibility. And what is it that makes that voice come to life for you? Well, I think, for instance, of a writer like Grace Paley, who in her story, Conversation with My Father, um, describes her father's heart as a bloody motor. And it's a very simple phrase, but it's so startlingly accurate uh, that at once I want to keep reading that story to see what this narrator will tell me next yeah. about the world that I thought I knew. I know you've also had a, you have other ideas about about voice, the voice that a writer adopts or discovers in in her writing. Do you want to say a word about about that? I think it's so interesting how uh, some writers can transform themselves from story to story and novel to novel, and other writers remain very much the same. Like many people, I've, I've spent a lot of the last year reading Elena Ferranti's um, quartet of novels set in Naples and in Italy. And one of the things that drew me into that, it must be well over a thousand pages, was um, the very strong voice of her narrator and the way in which she portrays the friendship between these two passionate women one of whom becomes a writer and the other who never exactly fulfills her enormous potential. So voice becomes a matter of authenticity. When we complain about, for example, how in a political campaign Hillary Clinton is always described in terms of the pantsuit she's wearing. These are conventional ways to make a character come to life, conventional kinds of markers. But you're, you're after something more authentic, something deeper that uh, can make uh, the character vivid. I am. I think that voice is, a, I mean, just as our speaking voice is a very personal part of us, so our writerly voice is a very intimate part of us. And Everyone has their own unique writerly voice. And I think one of the things we're looking for when we study writing, when we practice writing, is to make that voice stronger, more vivid, more our own. And when we fall into, for instance, describing Hillary Clinton in terms of her pantsuits, um, we're not really we're not really using our own voice. We're falling into a cliche or a stereotype. And that's one of the several reasons why that's such an aggravating description of a major politician. Because it's superficial. And it, we imagine fiction to be taking us to the deepest levels of what a character is. Ab absolutely. And we are looking to discover something about about both authors and characters, I think, that, that makes sense of the world and that gives us, us as readers, a sense of being let into the secrets of, of the author, the narrator, the character. I think we go from models of how to do this um, to the writers we love and to thinking that usually our first thought is not our best thought. Sometimes our tenth thought is our best thought. And I think it can be quite helpful to write in public places, because cafes, libraries, because then we're reminded how really diverse and different people are from the rather flimsy way we sometimes describe them on the page. 
people are always more inventive than we give them credit for. Exactly. And, and they also have more attitude than we give them credit <laughs> for. <laughs> I think one of the things that's most interesting about voice in fiction is how we think of voice in two different ways. We think of, on the one hand, the voice of the writer, and some writers, like for example Grace Paley or Juno Diaz, have such strong authorial voices that we recognize them almost immediately in every story they write. And then there are other writers, like Francine Prose and Toni Morrison, who are much more chameleon-like and take on a different voice with every novel. So that's one way we think about voice. And then, on the other hand, we think about voice as an author giving voice to her or his characters and allowing them to speak for themselves. And often that's a very exciting part of, a part of fiction. And when you think about your own work, I can't help but ask, are you more chameleon-like, or do you imagine hearing one voice as you're writing? I fear that I'm not a chameleon, though I would love to be, but I do really, really enjoy writing dialogue. I, I like letting my characters hold forth, and it sometimes takes them a little while to speak up. Sometimes they behave like boring British people and just talk about the weather and offer each other cups of tea. But if I just um, get them to rant or complain about someone or something, they usually become much more voluble. It makes me think of that wonderful story that John O'Hara told about how he would start a story with, uh, he would put two characters in a conversation. He wouldn't know anything about them. And after a couple of pages of small chit chat, he would have one of them say something dramatic to push the conversation along. Is that the kind of thing that you do when you're getting a, a sense of who these characters might be? Yes, I think that's very much what I do. I, I usually, as in real life, there's usually quite a bit of preliminary chat and politeness, and then the characters get down to business. and. One of my tasks in revision is to get rid of all those, or many of those preliminaries, because I do feel that politeness is a great virtue in daily life, but it can be a little boring on the page. So I, I'm guessing when you were editing fiction for Plowshares and reading so many stories, you had that experience that so many editors speak of, that you discover a new voice you haven't heard before, which might uh, at first put you off, but then immediately you you cannot help listening. As, yes, as the fiction editor at Plowshares magazine, um, we were getting about a thousand stories a month coming in, um, of which I was maybe reading about 150. And what made me stop was, um, was, a, was when I heard a new voice, or sometimes an established writer um, writing very wonderfully in a voice I had already heard before. And I think that's connected with what Virginia Woolf says in her essay, Mr. Bennett and Mrs. Brown. She says, life is changing so fast, fiction has to change to keep up with life. We can't keep writing the same old fiction when everything around us is changing. And we see that reflected in the voices of young writers. Writers, for instance, like Sapphire or Teju Cole. And what better example of it than to be in a MOOC with writers from all around the world, each of whom will have a different voice to contribute to the conversation. My colleague Margot Livesey grew up in the Scottish Highlands. A graduate of the University of York in England, she is the author of the short story collection Learning by Heart, which I had the pleasure of reviewing with high praise a long time ago, and of seven novels, including Eva Moves the Furniture, The House on Fortune Street, and The Flight of Gemma Harding. Her eighth novel, Mercury, has just been published. Margot has taught at many universities, including Boston University, Emerson College, and the Warren Wilson College MFA program for writers. She has been the recipient of fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Massachusetts Artist Foundation, and the Canada Council for the Arts, and she currently teaches at the Iowa Writers' Workshop. 
reading back over my first drafts, I discover that I introduce almost every character uh, in the same way by the color of their hair and the color of their eyes, which as much of my work is set in Scotland means that many, many characters have brown hair and blue eyes. And then once I've introduced them in this fascinating, dynamic way, I allow them to do four things. They nod, they look, they turn, and they shrug. So maybe not surprisingly, rereading my first drafts is often painful because these characters barely exist on the page. So I've spent a lot of time thinking about what, what is it in the books I love that makes a character walk off the page, that makes me believe a character exists beyond the page and that I can fall in love with them and argue and have opinions? And how can I make my own characters walk off the page? So in, in my efforts to get over, to get my characters to have something more than brown hair and blue eyes and do something other than shrug and nod, I've come up with a list of what I call prompts, rules, and admonitions for creating characters. Here are the prompts. Name the character. Use myself or someone I know discreetly. And I do, of course, want to have friends, so I'm very careful about how I use other people in my fiction. Borrow from a newspaper story. I'm a big fan of local papers where there's lots of sort of gossipy little items about who stole somebody's cabbages. Give the character a house, a flat, a doorway, or a car that I know well. Send her to a careers counselor. Let her talk. Uh, follow Aristotle's advice and make her act. Save someone, jump into a river. Give a sense of her role and position in her family and in society. Show her relationships. We may all die alone, but hardly anyone lives alone. And lastly, describe her appearance insofar as it's relevant. Then I have some rules, and I try to keep to these in everything I write. I have five rules. Good characters must have some failure or vice. So a good character might have bad handwriting or hate flowers. Bad characters must have some strength or virtue. Maybe my villain will have perfect pitch or the ability to recognize edible mushrooms. Every character should have something she shares with me. Um, perhaps it's a landscape we both like. Perhaps it's a liking for macaroni and cheese. And every character should have something I absolutely do not share, which might be the ability to recognize edible mushrooms or, I'm afraid, perfect pitch. And lastly, if the character is a stereotype, the bad sister, the absent-minded professor, be sure to make her not only a stereotype. And here are the admonitions. When creating a character very different from myself, I often need to create from the outside. I give the character a house, I find them a job, I give them activities and friends, and in the course of doing so, I figure out their inner lives. On the other hand, the, the clones and the doppelgangers, those characters who stand in for me, or whom I want my reader to think stand in for me, I create from the inside out. I know how they feel, I know what they want, I know what they fear, and then I go looking for an apartment for them and a job, and perhaps a bicycle if they're lucky. Gali Dehan Kalibach is an Israeli writer, essayist, and creative writing teacher. Her books include the young adult series, Arpelia, the two novels, The Locked Garden and On the Edge, which won the Prime Minister's Prize for Hebrew Writers. She has also been awarded the National Library's Pardes Scholarship and the Aikam Prize.
Hi, my name is Galit Dahan Karlibach. I'm a writer from Israel, now take part, is, part in the IWP, International Writing Program in Iowa. And I'm a still tourist, still excited tourist. And I've be, I, I have published four books uh, so far. Uh, the fifth book uh, will be published, my, uh, the novel will be published in December. And uh, I also teach writing. Uh, um, so one might think that a character is classified by, by weight, by definition, like round and like f uh, flat. But uh, I don't think like this because if, if you think about it, think about the critics uh, of Dickens. They used to claim that his characters are flat and not so sophisticated, that his word is white and black and it's not round. Uh, round characters, but I think that there is no, no there is nobody in the world who read his uh, books that can forget for one moment his characters. I want to give you an example from uh, Little Dorrit, uh, and I chose. Especially, I didn't ch chose choose a, a character a main character, but. Um, a margin like a uh, miss miss general so it's a dialogue it's very short uh, mr dorit so mrs general and i have been in conversation about you and we agree that you scarcely feel at home here in venice how is this emmy dorit she said i think i need a little time father mrs general sighing Papa is preferable from, from of address. Father is rather vulgar. Besides, the word papa gives a pretty form to the lips. Papa, potatoes, poultry, prunes and prism are, are all very good words for the lips, especially prunes and prism. So now, in few sentences, we, we don't need uh, subtitles uh, or, or description, uh, disc description about uh, how to describe uh, Miss, Miss Gen General. I mean, we understand it by the dialogue. By, and you need to imagine when you are in the theater. So it's not acceptable. It's, it's unacceptable that below the characters uh, will be, uh, will be a subtitle that describes the character, like uh, Shaylock from The Merchant of Venice by Shakespeare. So Shaylock is a Jewish and he is uh, a greedy. No, we, we need to understand it from the dialogue, from the talking. So, so Dickens uh, illustrated it very, very well. Another example that I want I wanted uh, to bring how to character to characterize character <laughs> it's uh, from Anna Karenina by Tolstoy. So uh, when Anna looks at her husband when she ca she comes from the train at Petersburg, as soon as the train stopped and she got out, the first person who attracted her attention was her husband. Oh my God! Why do his ears look like that? She thought, looking at his frigid and distinguished figure, figure, and especially at the cartilage that struck her at the moment as popping up the brim of his round hat. Catching sight of her, he came to meet her, his lips falling into their habitual mocking smile and his big tired eyes looking straight at her. So there, there is another amazing, amazing example how can we, we can describe a character uh, by the point of view of someone else. When I think about, when I think more about the aspect of the character, I think about limitation. And you know, I came from Hebraian lecture, uh, Hebraian culture. The Hebrew is very poor uh, of adjectives. So it's amazing because um, English and Latin, it's so rich with a lot of gorgeous, beautiful, amazing, um, uh, I cannot think of a better example like the Bible or if to be a specific in the story of Isaac's sacrifice. Now, the story is a very dramatic. We cannot say that it is not dra dramatic. What is more dramatic than a father who goes to sacrifice his beloved son? 
And if you will examine the story, you will discover that there is no one adjective word. One, no one. I mean, um, um, it's, it's really by verbs. So uh, how can we know that Abraham didn't take his time? How can we know that he wasn't diligent without an adjective? So I want to to read you uh, some first in English. For me, it's very, very something odd to do because I really know it's by my heart from Ibu. But I just want to show you um, how this dramatic uh, scene, it's so dramatic without to be very gorgeous, very beautiful, and, and etc. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now the son, thin only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and got thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him therefore a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abram rose up early in the morning, and settled his house, and took two of his young men with him. And Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up, and went unto the place of which God had told him. So I'm not going to read um, all the, it's very, very short excerpt, but I want when, when I, I want you to think about the situation. For example, you have maybe a son or daughter that come, you know, they, comes, they come every day from school and they, uh, they bring their drawing. And you as a parent wants to encourage them. So you told them, oh, my son, it's a beautiful drawing. And for the next, again, they, because this is what they do in the, in the, in the schools, they don't learn, unfortunately, Latin. So uh, <laughs> they bring another drawing. And then you as a good par parents, you say, oh, it's so lovely. And the next day, it's amazing. And the, in the next day, gorgeous, awesome, good. Excellent, very nice, I like it, I love it. I think after one month uh, about, if they will bring a really amazing drawing, you cannot tell them nothing because you overused the adjective. So now we can uh, return to the Bible and to understand it because without one adjective, we can understand that Abraham didn't take his time. He was very diligent to do what the God told him. How can I know it? Because he walked, I, I don't remember if it's written in the English, but in the Hebrew, he, it's, he, 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 he woke up very, very early in the morning and he did it. So he didn't take his time. So how did I describe it? By verbs. And if I use as a writer with verbs, this is very, it's reliability, re reliability to do it. It's, it's more reliable to do it. Because if I say my character is beautiful, so I don't trust my skills. And also I think that the reader is stupid. Yes. Because why, sh why may I think that he need to think that he is a beautiful? I need to show it. So I really need to show. And if I want to say, I love you, for me, the words I love you in the text, there, this is no meaning for me because I can describe it. Maybe I can describe the fingers, how they hold, how they hug the, the glass. So I can, uh, my character look, uh, looks at his fingers and how hugs the car, the, the glass. And maybe the character think, uh, thinks to, uh, to herself, Okay, I want her. This is a subtext, it's a subtext that his fingers will hug me. And I didn't say I love you or I love the hold of his fingers like this. So the limitation is very, very useful. Rukamaka Olusakwe is a Nigerian screenwriter, novelist, and nonfiction writer. Her work includes TV scripts, most recently the series The Calabash, essays, short stories, and a novel. In 2014, she was selected by the Africa 39 Project as one of the continent's 39 most promising writers under the age of 40. My name is Tukamako Lusakwe, and I'll be speaking um, with you about how to bring your characters to life and how the interactions with other characters make the story stronger. I started writing um, in 2010, and back then I destroyed so many of my first drafts because I will have this wonderful idea of a story 
putting them down on paper was very difficult for me. And uh, they remained trapped up there in my head and eventually they feel me, which, were, which many times was heartbreaking because I get to start all over again. But it changed in 2011 after um, I started work on my debut novel, Eyes of the Brothers. I was having this conversation with my mother about uh, one of my aunts who isn't really my favorite person in the world. I had lived with her after I graduated from high school in 1999, so I stayed with her for three months, and she's really, really a very complex person. I remember very clearly the fear of waking up every morning, uh, having to face her, how to make her happy, uh, the things to do without doing laundry, cooking, anything, just had to figure out my way out of that box. But she was really a very complex person and she flares up easily and and I was still young and very impressionable and too fearful and so each day what I do was to um map out plans. I'll have this kind of plans on okay, this is what I'm going to do today to make her happy so she doesn't flare up or shout at me or get me um very sad and depressed. So um after recounting that experience my mother, and I, I then realized, that this happened uh, 10 years after, I then realized that I have paid so much attention on this particular character, this my aunt, so much that after 10 years I could easily figure out what she was doing at a particular time of the day, how she reacts to people, even maybe she's sitting in a crowd and someone talks to her, I just knew there's that thing you would do that would make her flare up. Or maybe she's just looking at you, just the way she looks at you, it's kind of a communication. She wants you to do something. She doesn't really say it. And just looking at you, you're able to, you should be able to respond or she flares up. So that's that realization that I've paid so much attention watching and observing one person kind of paved way for me to realize that I can actually use such people, such complex characters, uh, such enigmatic, enigmatic people as vehicles to deliver my own story. So watching people, learning from them, and even briefly creating that um, relationship and or emotional attachment to them prompted me to think of how to transport the voices in my head into this, these bodies, these real life people. So what I'm saying is this, is for me, the first step of uh, for every successful story I write is finding the real life character whose mannerism or personality is so similar to the voices in my head. And only when I've created this kind of connection am I able to transfer the voices into the real life person. So what I'm doing is I have this soul transfer um, uh, this trip using real life person as vehicles to bring uh, my characters to life, which means I have characters who are very similar to the real people I interact with every day. So this, this soul transfer uh, trick, which simply is just transferring the voices in my head into the real life character who, who, whose personality and mannerism matches them, made it easier for me to be able to write stories like i would have a story to write and i have this person who fits perfectly with the voices in my head what i just do is just sort of transfer that person and that person becomes the character so and another uh, one of the experiences I had when I came to Iowa early, uh, New League was the man walking down, I was looking for direction to the city mall, so I met this man, he was wearing shorts, uh, shorts, blue, yellow and black Hawkeye t-shirts and, and old Nike running shoes. So I was lost and I was asking him, please reach the way to the city mall. He just, he had the steel in his eyes and he didn't even look at me, no eye contact, not, he just walked straight. So the character was quite enigmatic because for me, this is not something I would ordinarily do. So I still remember very clearly the black and yellow Hawkeye t-shirt he was wearing over a blue shirt and old Nike orange. I remember also the steel in his eyes and the set of his jaw and the mop of blonde hair. He was just walking. Maybe he's preoccupied with something else, but that moment as a character, the, the first uh, reaction for me was that he doesn't like me, that's why he excited me. So for if I'm having such conflict in a, in, in, in a story, I, I would choose that man. I don't know his name, but I call him Mr. Steel. So, so there's Steel in his eyes, so I, I called him Mr. Steel. So that, that little brief uh, moment 
that's the way his um, his reaction. Where he didn't he didn't even react to me. My reaction to him then it's sort of a very very complex um, conflict I want to um, uh, employ in my next story. I am a human being living in an open theater, and so I get to watch and observe and identify people whose mannerisms can bring to life the voices in my head. An example of such creation for me was in the story Kim's Nightmare. Let me read out how the narrator in the story described the character Ibuka. She said, He had an enviable elegance. I squinted at his photos, at the warm eyes hidden behind bull fringe ray-ban, and perched atop a remarkable nose. His groomed full beard swallowed half his face, and his skin was so, so clear and so fair, like it had never toiled under the sun. He had the body that hinted at a man toying at overseas for, and his muscles were taut under his shirt, stretching from shoulder to shoulder. I had never seen a man so beautiful. When I was writing that story, it took me a little while to figure out the character who can perfectly bring um, this voice home. So what I did for solution was to go through my friends list on Facebook and I found this guy, I uh, initially interacted and argued with him over various issues on um, Facebook and he fits that description so perfectly. You know, the physical description, the way he argues, the, the force behind him. And so it was easy to, to now call my character by that Facebook friend's name and watch him perform that plot and the t story turned out successfully. And I must admit that sometimes it doesn't always work out so easily, especially when you're writing stories uh, with tens of characters, as for example, like in uh, Malone James, A Brief History of Seven Kids, which has more than 75 characters. How do you find such number of people and make emotional uh, connections with them so as to deliver such powerful work of fiction? So for me, for Iowa, Iowa is a very well-planned, beautiful city. Which I feel equips every writer, gives them the opportunity to, to, to write, to create, and to make this just like an open theater. On Saturday, I went to the city library. Uh, I'm working on my, my, my third work of fiction, so set in Iowa. To be able to capture this open theater, to capture various voices and so many characters, maybe up to 50 characters in the, in the book, what I did was to visit the city library on Saturday, and I just sat uh, one of the benches opposite the bread garden, and the one facing the, the playground. So people walked by in droves, young students, feisty young students played out their, did their roles in open theater. They laughed, they got the way they talked, which was so different from my home country in Nigeria. So it it's, was really a very huge resource for me. And you have the parents who sat on benches reading books and watching their children play in the playground there. So um, it was a real life theater for me. And for everyone I watched, their laughter, the way they flung their hair, the way they walked or fiddled with their cell phone, these little markers enabled me to make emotional connections. And they are very, very memorable because I, often I still remember faces contorted in excitement and the way they talk to each other. So now I'm writing a book. I, I like to believe that when a, re a reader comes in contact with such characters, especially the, 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 the unique markers, the unique markers, the, the, their description, the way they talk, and the, especially the excitement around them or the way they react to the next person. Like the young man I saw when I was uh, walking down the streets on Saturday, he was walking with his cell phone like he was cowering away from himself. He's such, he's, I didn't have any conversation with him, but I would want to create a character around that person. Someone cowering, he's so tall, but it's like he's hiding from himself. So such uh, resource, such open theater gives me opportunity to transfer voices. Like I want to write about a character who doesn't talk much. I would, I would like to uh, transfer that character into the person I see walking down the street, who I feel fits that um, personality perfectly. The, the, the challenges I, I faced uh, when I started um, transporting the, the, the making the soul transfer trick I, I used was trying to disguise the character. But I realized that um, I censor myself. And when I disguise the character, I completely lose them. And when I lose them, I lose their sense of the story and I, my plot sort of flops. So what I do is I just refuse to give a damn. I just write them. I'm writing a fictional story, not really their own story. What I'm using is 
I'm using real life. Okay, this is how you laugh. This is how you talk. This is how you react. This is how you ordinarily do things. But I'm setting a fictional story which is not really about you. But I, use, I need you as the vehicle to really deliver the story. I need you the way you are in real life to play out this particular part I am setting on paper. So I don't care about disguising them or the way they walk or the way they talk. I don't use the real name, but I don't tell their own story. I am not telling the story I fabricated, but I need you and your mannerism to play out that part for me. Kate DeSherry, American author of The Fine Art of Fucking Up, is a graduate of Lewis and Clark College and holds an MFA from the University of California at Riverside. She's also the coordinator of the IWP's Between the Lines, a residential summer program that brings together aspiring writers aged 16 to 19 for creative writing and cultural exchange. So my name is Kate DeSherry and I am the author of The Fine Art of Fucking Up. So for me, character is at the heart of fiction writing. Um, for me, it's what drives and informs every other aspect of craft, including plot. Everything for me comes from character. Um, I understand character as a two-part animal. There's, first, there's the character's presentment. That's how I always think about it. And, and by that, I mean the manner or the mode in which that person is presented. Right. So that's all the things the character does, the way they move, the tics, their mannerisms, the way they talk. Um, a character's sense of humor, the habits and routines, all the little details, the way she looks, her dress, um, her personality and sense of humor, those kinds of things, presentment, that's all kind of one part of character. And then there's everything else which is happening, that's happening under the surface. So not things like her troubled childhood or the things that she wants to say but you don't actually put in dialogue. I'm talking about a bigger, a bigger picture than that. Um, which are the intellectual and emotional core of the character at the deepest level, right? So that first part of character, all those details are very multi-layered for me, um, and they have everything to do with detail, thinking in detail, and thinking about how and when to deploy those details for, for the most successful use, right? Um, some details are used, I think, to create, just to create a fully realized human, right? Because people are complicated and need the details, some are for that. But others are more critical to story, and these kind of smaller details can reveal personality traits, emotions, um, or things that are kind of essential to the narrative arc that you're building. And then I just want to also say that that smaller stuff, that first group of characterizations are also incredibly important. And I just want to note a few things about that. The key with some of these smaller things are the personal details, which is what I think of and talk about as presentment, right? The way that you're presenting the characters. You need to be not just specific, but particular. Um, by which I mean, you don't have to describe exactly necessarily the way your character looks in great detail, unless that's somehow central to your story. The reader can fill that in, but you do need to know things like um, the pinky side of her left hand is always covered in ink because she's a lefty and she loves the pens from the local credit union, even though they're terrible and they're inky and the ink doesn't dry quickly enough for a left-handed writer. That you have to know, right? Those kinds of details that have to do with who she is. Um, and, and that's why I say you need to be particular. Um, you need to know those intimate details and you also need to think carefully about when to deploy them. And that's because, like any great liar, you the writer, the fiction writer, have to convince your audience, and you'll do this with great care. Um, the characters will become alive when they take on these details, so that's one part of it. And you can write a whole novel based on some of these specific details. But you, what you have to do is think about the way that you can, the way that you can include them, that will reveal something about your story or move move the concept, the the construction of that character forward. Um, so, so, for example, it's like with dialogue. Every addition that you make should take you somewhere or should take your reader somewhere and move you forward. Um, maybe the strange way that a character ties their shoes indicates something about an unconventional parent or something like that, and that there's a moment when you reveal that, and that's when you include that small detail. I just want to say probably the most important thing I can about character um, which will lead very quickly to a discussion of writing female characters in particular. And that is um, that the characters you write do not need to be nice. I just I want to say this um, really clearly. They don't need to be a friend for the reader. That's not what you're trying to think of. 
And no matter what you hear or if you're told it, I want to tell you, your characters don't even need to necessarily be sympathetic. Um, they need to be interesting. They need to be compelling. We as human beings and as readers are fascinated by mistake makers. And that is what you want to write about. That's your terrain, right? The, the troubled, the flawed, those are the characters that you want on the page. Um, and this leads to a little discussion about approaching character and particularly female characters. In contemporary literature, there is an ongoing discussion about likability, in particular with female characters. And it's complicated and it's a little bit of a rambling issue, but the, de the debate is persistent. Um, you can look at or Roxane Gay, who wrote an essay entitled Not Here to Make Friends on the Importance of Unlikable Female Protagonists. Um, the writer Abigail Haas said that the question of likability always hangs over female characters in a way I've never seen haunting male protagonists in literature and film. Men get to be interesting and flawed as a matter of course, but the moment you have a woman or a girl up there center stage, suddenly the most important note is, well, is she likable? Will women be able to relate? And what I wonder as a writer is who is hanging likability out there over female characters? Who is it that's asking that question of writers? Who is it that cares and makes us think that we should care? And what I want to ask of all of you writers is to please, please don't get distracted by that question of likability or relatability when you're creating your characters. I don't really know that there are readers that aren't reading books because they're concerned they won't find a friend in the page. And if you get distracted by that, um, I think you find yourself in danger of being limited. Um, and accepting what Roxane Gay describes as the code of conduct that dictates the proper way to be, and then the proper way to write. Um, it's my position as a female writer who creates women in fiction that to address or consider likability or relatability is also to affirm the conceit that interesting, complex, flawed women characters are categorically unlikable. And for me, that's the central problem. Um, women and men, overreactors, mistake makers, trouble causers, these people are not unlikable people. I know them, I like them, I write about them. In many cases, I love them. Um, and it's not that I dislike conventional or unimpeachable characters, it's that I, and it's not that I find those characters dull, which is often the accusation, it's that I simply do not find them. They literally don't exist, and that's because there aren't people who aren't like that. Um, so I think you find that if you, if you veer toward that, or if you're told to, your characters won't ring as true. Um, there's this terrific essay on likability, and in it the writer Meredith Marin quotes Carol DeSanti, who's the vice president and editor, editor at large of Viking Penguin. She says, there's a relationship between the characters women read and who we think we're allowed to be. What transpires on the page is not independent of the real world. The stories we produce, the characters we write, are necessarily tied up in a broader consequential cultural directives regarding what acceptable women look like. And it's not only women. I mean, I'm, I'm using that example, but there are any other category of character um, that this can apply to. And they may, what, I guess what I, what I especially want to add is, I'm not suggesting that characters shouldn't be likable or that they shouldn't be wonderful. Um, and I think that there's, there can be sort of a, a disconnect, even within a com communities of women writers, um, who there are women writers who feel that the worst thing they can do is write a likable narrator because then somehow it's not literary or then somehow um, they're not writing someone complex. Um, and so one of the things I want to say is that I, I don't want to suggest that women writers or male writers should or shouldn't write a likable woman, especially a likable woman. Um, I think that there can be great characters who are likable and who you do want to be your friends, who are really hero heroines, um, true heroines. And I think that they can be interesting and complex as well. So I think that the main thing is to try not to let those thoughts or concerns um, infiltrate your creation of a character and that the character be the complex, full human that you want them to be, whether or not they're relatable or likable. Um, and that's become so, so much a part of the conversation in contemporary women's literature. Um, and it really doesn't have a place in writing. It really, we're not looking for characters we like or don't like. That's not really, it shouldn't really even be a part of the conversation. In this class and in your writing life, you will talk and think a lot about identity, both your own as a creator, but also 
identity as it relates to the characters that you draw on the page. Issues of identity are not always straightforward, and I want to talk a little bit about some of the complications that you may face. Uh, recently, the writer Lionel Shriver gave a talk about cultural appropriation in literature, and what she said, to summarize briefly, is that fiction writers shouldn't have to worry about cultural appropriation or what kinds of things um, they choose to write about, what sort of perspectives they choose to write about. They should be able to write about whatever they want, however they want. Um, and at the heart of the conversation are some questions, including how can a writer know an experience well enough to write about it if she has not had that experience herself? And are there limits to what creator, creative writers should or should not write? So I want to think a bit about this more specifically. The questions are, can a writer successfully fictionalize a character that is of a background entirely different from her own? And in particular, can and should a writer do so when the character is a member of a minority or an otherwise marginalized or disadvantaged group? And if the writer does choose to do that, what does she need to consider? Is it important that the stories of marginalized groups reach a readership? Or is the essential thing that those stories be told by members of that specific community? Can a woman write well about a man or a man about a woman? Can a white American woman write well about a black American family? Could a straight man write well about a homosexual character? So these are kind of the questions um, that, are, that are very much at the front of the conversation in the literary community now, be largely because of Lionel Shriver's talk. Before we go on, I want to give you a disclaimer, which is that I don't have any real answers for you. Um, I have these important and necessary questions, and I have some ways that you may think about these things, but each of you must answer for yourself. So it is a fact of the vocation that we as creative writers must occupy mental and emotional spaces that are different from our own, right? That is a part of what we are doing. We write fiction. We make up stuff. We make up people. And we do this right out of thin air. We write characters that have suffered losses that are different from our own. We write characters that face challenges that are different from our own. This is what we are here to do. And it's complicated and nuanced and important. And it's our obligation to think critically about our creative choices. So first, I'll describe the problems a little bit and then talk about some ways that we might think about them. It's important to remember Certain writers occupy a position of greater cultural and historical privilege than others. This privilege can provide any number of advantages, not the least of which is greater access to publication or readership. And it's our responsibility, each of us, to assess privilege for and of ourselves. Because entrenched or deeply internalized privilege can cause a writer to be insensitive to what it might be like to live as a person whose voice is ignored or muzzled. And that insensitivity can make it difficult to successfully or considerately create minority or marginalized characters in fiction. The writer Foss Meadows says, when writers decide to speak for and about more marginalized groups, that can have a material impact on the ability of those groups to speak for themselves and be heard, especially if their personal accounts differ, as they invariably do, from those of more prominent outsiders. The complication is that when we write from the point of view of others, we might filter those experiences through our own skewed or biased lens, and that can result in diminishment or worse, stereotyping or even appropriating another group's story. So there are two ways to think about how and what can happen when we make these kinds of creative choices. There are issues of craft, and then there are issues of cultural identity. No matter the identity, questions will always come up regarding the writing itself. Is the character alive? Is the character vivid and dynamic and persuasive? That is a craft conversation, and it happens in a class, in a workshop, between writers, with an editor, sometimes with a critic. How well, how fully is the fictional human being drawn? But there is also the consideration, what are the implications regarding the character's representation of a minority, marginalized, or disadvantaged group or identity. As readers and writers, we want to encourage a great diversity of story. We want different cultures to enrich one another. We want the kind of conversations that take place when varied human beings intersect, be it a writer with their characters or different characters within a book or readers discovering a new fictionalized world on the page. 
Works of creative writing can increase compassion, sympathy, understanding, and tolerance. But we, the creators, must think hard about questions of racism, misogyny, homophobia, stereotypes of all kinds, as well as questions about history and immigration. So to be clear, I'm not suggesting that social justice must must or should be your purpose as a writer. Um, only that if you're going to include a character who is wildly different from yourself, you the writer, then you are taking on a responsibility to think about those things carefully and to be attentive to what you are doing and how you are doing it. Um, our work has implications and we need to be thoughtful about what those are. It's my position that a writer should feel she can write about anything. We are creative artists. We are bound to create, and it's very difficult, if not impossible, to do that well if we feel restricted. We adopt personas, and it's true we use fictional characters to tell stories that we believe to be important. That kind of usage is not necessarily problematic. We're expected to use these personas and characters and identities for our creative ends. We inhabit other people. We should, and we must. But it is the manner in which we do so, and as importantly, the manner in which we think about these creative acts and what they represent and teach and claim in the wider context, context that makes the difference. I'll say what I have said before. What transpires on the page is not independent of the real world. The stories that we produce and the characters we write aren't necessarily tied up in broader, consequential cultural concerns. So this is the best that I can do for an answer. A writer must self-assess and must bring careful, critical thought to what she puts on the page. No matter her larger purpose or objective with a creative project, if she makes the choice to include a diversity of characters, and therefore characters unlike herself, she must do so with respect, care, and more than likely some research. This kind of careful consideration can only make a project better and more successful, and it can only bring authenticity, consciousness, and humanity to the work. So my advice to you is to think hard and to write well.